get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, now Laura Roeder, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Laura Roeder. She's founder of MeetEdgar.com, which is a social media automation tool designed to prevent updates from going to waste. Basically, you don't have to keep feeding in post after post because it recycles them for you, saves you tons of time. Since Edgar's launch, they've grown to 16 employees and have more than $2.8 million in annual recurring revenue, and they've bootstrapped the entire way. Congratulations, Laura. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. You know, I always like to include a fun fact in the beginning so people get to know you, something most people don't know. And so your husband says what's weird about you is you have no hobbies. (laughs) And you just read business books all day. So what's on tap now? What are some of your favorites? Um, the book I'm reading right now, which is, is business related, um, is is called Debt. I think it's called Debt the Last 5,000 Years. And it's kind of a history of debt and different economic systems. Um, mm. It's it has like it's a really long book, so it has some dry parts and some super interesting parts. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. What are some of your all-time favorites? All-time favorite business books, um, all-time favorite is probably Scaling Up. It used to be called The Rockefeller Habits by Warren Harnish. Yeah, it's a yeah, great one. We run our business by that book. Um, mm. I love Double Double by Cameron Harold. Yeah. Um, the Heath Brothers books are all Made to stick. Really oh, yeah. Those are awesome. Mm. I was thinking about you this morning on my drive-in because, obviously, we're talking today, and I'm listening on Audible to the Customer fund- Funded Business Right um, yeah, and so I was like, this is perfect for me to listen to on my way in before talking to Laura. And uh, so I also want to go to the path because you're sort of, you know, overnight success after 10 years, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I want to talk about the journey a little bit and start, where did you grow up? I grew up in Austin, Texas, which is oh. where I'm, I'm back right now. Okay. And so when you were growing up, what did you want to be? Um, for a while, I wanted to be a speech writer. Speech writer? That would, really? That would be cool, Why? yeah. Because I liked to write, um, I don't, I was one of those kids that loved to read and write stories and stuff like that. I don't know why I wanted to write. I guess it seemed important to write speeches. I don't know. Well, you sort of do in a sense. Um, sort of. You know, with the creating fame and, and when you're doing the information courses. Mm-hmm. But um, your parents were both entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. Yeah. So my dad is an architect um, and my mom helped run the business, do the books and the finances and things like that. So. It, mostly they ran it just them. He had employees for a while, didn't like yeah. having employees. My, my dad's the type of business owner that loves the craft. He loves being an architect. Yeah. He doesn't care about running the business. Um, he hated the hassle of having employees. Before you said speechwriter, I thought for sure you were going to say from age two, you had that lemonade stand or something from early <laughs> on. What did you learn from your parents early on about running company? I mean, I think I was very lucky just that I grew up in a family that made its money that way because I know so many people when they want to start a business, it just seems like such a foreign concept to Mm -hmm. them. And often their family and friends are very unsupportive saying that's crazy and, you know, small businesses fail. So obviously when you grow up in a small business family, it's it's just a normal way to make money. Um, I also got a really great example from my family that, you know, I only recognize now as an adult, my dad was not a workaholic at all, Mm. you know, was home every evening, every weekend for all the school events. Like he actually used self-employment so he could have a more flexible schedule. Mm. And so many people just use it as an excuse. Like I run my own business. I have to work more than anyone. Um, And now that's something that I I really admire, you know, now that I'm a parent that he made that Mm -hmm. choice to say, I don't just need to make as much money as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. I work for myself so that I can have this freedom. That balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how old is your your child? Uh, 14 months. 14 months. Wow. You look well rested. (laughs) (laughs) I I have help. (laughs) So how do you balance? Because it is a tough balance and you, Uh it's not like it's just you. You have 16 employees. Your co-founder is your, your husband, right? Right. So how do you balance all, everything? Yeah, so I mean, so my husband Chris is is CTO of the business now. He built the initial version. So 
I mean, in some ways that's, that's difficult, you know, to have us both working in the business, but it keeps us very aligned. Like, you know, we both have a big priority for family and living our lives and neither one of us can say, make that excuse of like, oh, I have to work because we know what's going on at work and we know like, well, you can (laughs) change your job however you want, you know? Um, So, yeah, so we both scaled back a lot after Hector was born, but um, I was pregnant when I launched the business. So, I mean, this was always the plan. I knew I was going to take three months off maternity leave when the business was still young. So, Just for, for everyone out there. If someone is hesitating in starting a business, listen to what, you know, I want to hear what you just said. You didn't wait. You, right. you started the business while you were pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was yeah. an incredibly valuable constraint because I knew, okay, when this business is only six months old, I'm going to be off for three months. And, yeah. you know, it was my first baby, so right. I didn't know what I was in for. Right. So it was actually a really great constraint because I never got stuck in like, I have to be an integral part of the business from day one. It's like, mm. I have to build this business so it can run without me because right. that's, that's my only choice. So that's what I did. So what made you decide while you were pregnant to launch? I mean, you could have just as easily said, you know what, I'll take three months and then I'll launch it after I get back. Why, why then? You, to be honest with you, I never even considered. You just It was ready to go and that's delay. when you were doing it. Right. We had had the idea. So the idea for software came that out That blows of my mind, Laura. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, the idea for the software came out of training that we were doing. Um, and so the software, you know, started getting built. So I'm just trying to think of how the timing would have worked yeah. out. So I guess we had already started kind of like building it like when I got pregnant, but not, you know, saying 100% like this yeah. is going to be the launch date and this is going to be our yeah. next business, more just kind of playing around with the idea. So yeah. um, I just knew that I could I could make it work. I it don't just know. progressed to that point and that was, you should have named the software Hector. You know, like you and your <laughs> husband, why is it Edgar? <laughs> and I don't know if I've said, so you've obviously read Hector's our son. So people... Right, I've that's actually, what I mean. Yeah. yeah, I've actually never called him Edgar, but like other people do all the time. <laughs> Um, yeah, Edgar was actually a code name that we used internally. And when it came, came time to name the business, we, we couldn't think of anything better. So we're like, let's just call it Edgar. And it seems to have caught on. People seem to like it. So, you know, I ask for selfish reasons about the boundary thing because mm-hmm. I have horrible boundaries. My wife would agree <laughs> with me on that. And so what do you do to create the boundaries so that, I mean, do you, what kind of schedule are you looking at? Mm-hmm. Do you stop at this time and then you have dinner and then you maybe work in the evening? What is What does your schedule look like? So, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for a long time, but I've never been a workaholic. Like, I've mm. never pulled an all-nighter. I've never, like, I've mm. worked I'm on- also surprised about that because <laughs> when your husband says weird hobbies is all you do is read business books, I picture you just pedal the metal the whole way through. Well, because I, I love business. I mean, yeah. and I guess that's what makes this. This is never. Teach me, it, Laura. How do I? Yeah. Tell me about your boundaries here. <laughs> yeah. So um, so after Hector was born, I worked part time for a while. Yeah. Now I'm back full time and Chris works part time and then we have a nanny in the afternoon. Yeah. So like right now I'm working from home. Our nanny's here. Yeah. I often go to an office. Um, but yeah, so I my usual schedule is like have lunch with the family uh, from like noon to 1 30 our nanny comes at 1 30 leaves at six and then we do you know family dinner and hangout time so um yeah i don't work on the on the weekends or the evenings and and again it's that constraint of like you have this much time to get done how are we going to do it you know yeah yeah so i mean let's talk about growing quickly because you grew really quickly um you know from from the first glance obviously you've built Mm -hmm. it up over years and years Mm -hmm. but um and i want to go back about your journey but first about your first hire for Mm -hmm. Meet Edgar. Mm -hmm. So the way that Edgar was formed is a little different because, so the training company, LKR Social Media, kind of transformed Mm -hmm. in Edgar. So it's not like we like shut one down and then launch the next. So we launched Edgar with the LKR team. So who was on the team at the time? Yeah. So at the time it would have been um, like Sarah who does our operations, Tom, our writer, content writer, Christina doing customer service. Yeah. Um, another woman named Sarah who helps and still helps with customer service. So let's say like four or five people on the team and then yeah. Chris coding it. Yeah. Um, and we launched in July, 2014. Um, so yeah, we've gone from like five to like 16 employees and you know, who was your is first that? hire for LKR? Um, for LKR, well the first person 
all my businesses have sort of blurred together. So the, yeah. Uh, yeah, the first hire for LKR was a woman who helped with also named Sarah. I've had lots of Sarahs in my life. Um, she helps with customer service and then she also helped like do some sort of tech, like a virtual assistant basically, yeah. some tech administrative yeah. types of tasks. A lot of little things, you know, that were left over. You know what's interesting about that, Laura, is because you have to get the team on board too. So you're, mm -hmm. when I was looking at creating fame and you, you have other info products and, you know, it sounds simple, but it's not. How did you get or get people on board because they're used to doing LKR, right? And then you're transitioning to something new. Mm -hmm. How do you present that and have them see the, a different vision, I guess? Yeah, yeah. I mean, people were really excited about it. and I think They were, part of, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I think partially because, one, we included people all the way through. So, mm. you know, yeah, our so designer, you yeah. like uh, we also had a designer on the team at the time who'd been working for LKR and she's the one who created the Edgar logo, the ah, Edgar cool. branding. I gotcha. Um, Julie Field, to give her a shout out because you can go hire her now. So oh, really? Plug. All right. Um, and, you know, Tom, our writer, he got to create the whole like brand voice and all, all the content and so I think it was a pretty exciting project because it's like we get to build together something gotcha. new. And and because it came out of the training, like we really created the software for ourselves. Like yeah. we had been doing this really manual process. So the team was also just excited that we were gonna get to use the software. So like I hate this doing this stuff. manual stuff or create something for us. <laughs> right, right. But but it sounds like you got them involved in the process and that mm -hmm. was a key in having them on board the whole way through and it's almost like you're co creating this. Absolutely. And, you know, now that the team is a little larger, it, it is being co-created. You know, Christina, our head of customer service, she she makes the decisions about customer. She's not asking me, you know, can I give this person a refund or like what, yeah. you know, coupon code do we do? Like she just decides she takes what our ownership. policies are. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And so beyond the LKR team, because you've grown beyond that, mm -hmm. who is the first uh, key hire after you grew beyond your capabilities with that? Another programmer, programmer. Um, time, yeah, another full-time Ruby on Rails developer, and that that was actually felt like a big deal because yeah. that to me that made it much more real because it's like okay, it's not just this thing that Chris made kind of in his spare time. Like right. we're a software company now, we're hiring because Ruby yeah. on Rails developers get paid a lot more than any other position right. I hired before. It's it's right. a high it's a it's a six figure paycheck career. Um, so to me, that was like a big level up, like, whoa, we're building a team of you yeah. know, development professionals and, and we're paying them a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so that was initial now, now, what are you looking for now? Still more Ruby on Rails or? Uh, we're always, yes. You are? Okay. Cause I may have someone, I may have some people for you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We're always hiring developers, um, hiring, uh, both web designers and mm -hmm. software designers, um, always hiring customer service. Basically, if it's a role like software company, um, we want to talk to you about. Yeah, it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I know you used to live in Chicago. I'm in Chicago, and mm -hmm. some sort of Ruby on Rails. I think it did start in Chicago. I don't remember. Well, yeah, DHH who started it, his company, Thirty Seven Signals. Right, right. So definitely some Chicago ties. Yeah. And I want to hear about your philosophy. And you've talked before about bootstrap business hiring. So what's mm -hmm. your philosophy? Because it's not like you have all this venture funding. You can just go out and hire a bunch of people. You I guess I'll let you you talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So what I did differently along the way. So at this point, you know, the, the company makes a good amount of money. So we hire, you know, full time people right out the gate. But what I did differently when I didn't have so much budget that I would really recommend a lot of people do is I did not hire VAs. So I mentioned this woman, Sarah, was sort of like a VA in her right. role. But she was not someone who was like marketing herself as a virtual assistant. She was someone looking for a part-time work from home job. Right. And that's very different. Like a contractor. Of, right, right, right. The thing about a virtual assistant is they have their own business. They have a VA business that they're trying to grow. So they either need to raise their rates with you, they need to grow their team, and then maybe, you know, put a different contractor. Like you're one of their clients and they have other clients and they have their own business that they're growing. Right. Whereas people who are just looking for part-time work, which by the way, a lot of moms, there are so mm. many talented women who now want to yeah. work part-time so they can spend more time with their young kids. Yeah. You can't go in the corporate world and get a good job part-time. They just don't exist. Right. Um, so like the first project manager that I hired, she was part-time. She had extensive project management experience, mm -hmm. but you like she'd watch in video games. You can't go to a video game company and say, I want a part-time, you know, right. home producer job. Yeah. So I got her talent instead. And 
instead of like being one of many clients, she just worked in my business. Yeah, and that's smart. The kind of like dedication and ownership that someone can have when you're all creating the business together versus like your one client, it, it's just yeah. a totally different feel. Yeah. So how do you find these people? Um, just through job sites online, you know, that's how, that's still how we hire people. Like a lot of people say you have to do recruiting, you have to be reaching out to people. Um, we try to do that when we can, it's very time consuming. Yeah. So we just use regular job listings and people apply and then we hire them. <laughs> Any particular sites we should point people towards that they yeah. want to get started? Um, we work remotely is a great site for remote jobs. That, that's one of our favorites. Nice. Thank you. Um, so when you were 22, you started your journey, but you had a design job and mm -hmm. what made you quit at the time? Was this the one in Chicago? Yes. Okay. Yes. This, this is my only real job. I was <laughs> living yeah. in Chicago. Um, the, the biggest thing that made me quit was I, I wasn't happy being just a designer. I was at a small agency and I was very interested in the marketing side and serving the client and kind of the bigger strategy where design, like people who are great at design love it and they're so happy that they only get to design all day. Like, they like I was the craft, okay. yeah. Right, right. I was okay at it. I was interested in other things. So I was kind of looking down my career path and I thought, okay, to, to be more involved strategically, like right now I'm a junior designer and then I'll be like an associate designer, and a designer and then a senior designer and then someday I'll be like art director and then I'll get to be on the strategy right, meetings. Right. That's 10 years away. I was like, I don't have that kind That's of That's now. Yet. You'd be just doing that right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, exactly. So, yeah, I thought, well, if I if I work for myself, I'll get to interact with the clients. You know, I'll get to do like the whole all of the pieces of business that are that are interesting to me. Um, and I actually tried to hedge. I, I asked my work if I could go part time. Mm, smart, so I could yeah. Have the best of both worlds, and they said yes, and then they said no right before I was supposed mm, to start. Why? Um, they said because if I wanted to work part time, everyone would want it's to. Like that's a great idea. Everyone else is going to do it, do it too. Well, I was like, yeah, you guys don't have any work. Like, you should have everyone work part. You would see your business would be much more profitable because I was just bored a lot of the time too. Um, but they didn't see it that way. But so at that point, I had built it up in my head so much that like, you know, working full time was not an option. So I just yeah. quit the job at that point. Yeah, and it wasn't a mystery because you had seen your parents do it. Right. And right. so it wasn't like this really scary thing. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah, it was. I, I still had, you still had rent in Chicago, right? I mean, what did you do after you quit? I started going to local Chamber of Commerce events because okay. I didn't. Here's the thing. I had lived in Chicago for like a year and a half. I went to University of Texas and then I moved yeah. there. Why so Chicago? It's, it's cold it, here. My, my, well, I didn't stay that long. <laughs> my, uh, my boyfriend at the time got a job. So I just gotcha. figured like fun, you know, big city sure. to move to. Um, but I didn't have a network in Chicago, and I literally did not know a single business owner when right. I when I quit my job and started freelancing. So yeah. I'm like, oh, who needs websites, businesses? I guess I need to meet business owners. Like, I guess they're in the Chamber of Commerce. So I just started going to all the different chamber events in the different neighborhoods. So what did you start getting traction on? Because you probably had a couple of different things you were offering, right? I mean, I was just yeah, I was just offering any kind of design. So like you know, business cards, websites. Um, so yeah, one of my first big clients um, was like a law firm, like a young guy, you know, maybe twenty five, who was starting his own law firm. Um, I did some work for like University of Illinois, I guess, a local university. Yeah. Like just randomly, one of their departments needed a website. I mean, I anything. It's a big client, yeah. Well, it sounded big, but it was like, you know, maybe $500 or something. Like, <laughs> any, anyone who would have It's good me, on your yeah. logo page. Right? Yeah, yeah, like a financial services firm. Um, yeah, just anyone who needed anything done, I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> so was the next transition to, to info products? Because I was reading, um, how did B-School with Marie <laughs> Forleo come about? So yeah, the next transition, so I was doing web design and that transition into like social media consulting um, but that basically immediately became information products because mm. I just sort of discovered that business model around the same time that I quit doing web design. Yeah. So I started like I quit web design, started doing social media in 2009. Um, I met Marie Forleo. I hired her as my coach. Really? And, mm -hmm. That's why I met her and we became friends. Um, and then we launched B-School together in, in 2010. That's a huge hit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I we launched B-School together and then I only did it for two years because I left 
we did it. We did like two or three launches and then I left in 2011. Um, and yeah, now it's just like even more of a phenomenon than like I could ever imagine. So what did you learn from B school and from launching, doing those two launches and creating it? I mean, Marie is just like, I mean, she's just an incredible entrepreneur. One, she's just a brilliant marketer and I learned a lot about marketing from her and she is very much like a, just person who keeps improving everything. Like one of the reasons she's done so well with B school is she made it look professional before anyone else did. And even like, it was much less professional when she and I did it, but she would always push like, Laura, we need to spend a lot on these videos. You know, we need to make yeah, them look her good. quality is, is amazing. Right. Right. And she really had that vision of like this, you know, I want to up level the creativity and the quality and no one was really doing that at the time. So I think she really saw you know, out of our little bubble, like how can I make this not just like an info product, but a, a much bigger business. So, um, yeah, I mean, I learned a lot working from her. She just, I think is someone with incredible vision. I think Lauren, what's interesting too, is I want to hear what you put in the course and what you kept out, because I think that also applies to what, what, when we talk about meet Edgar, mm -hmm. what you keep in and what you, what you keep out also. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's a little bit harder to, remember now I mean we did pare it down so much because when we first talked about the idea I mean the idea went through so many iterations I remember we wanted to do like quarterly live events but then we were like I don't know if people want to like fly out every quarter and then we're like okay and that eventually got boiled down to like an eight-week online program yeah. um, and we just wanted to teach like what we felt were just like the absolute mo like if you don't learn anything else about online business like what are the yeah you know, there's six modules, like what are the six most important things, uh, which, which was definitely a challenge and it's still, we made it like right. way too big. Boil everything in business into eight weeks. It's tough. Right. It's tough to do. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So what's one of the biggest learnings or lessons that you learned from Marie or, or best advice she's given you? I mean, I think, yeah, one of the biggest things I learned from Marie is like that you don't have to do it the way anybody else does it. You know, and, and we were saying she really innovated in the quality, but she also like it was I mean, she would kind of drag me along the stuff because it was all anything creative was her idea. Like anything creative we did in B school, Murray. And then I was like, Okay, I'm gonna like figure out how to put the team together and, and kind of that kind of stuff. The processes. Um, yeah, yeah. And she would have us do these music videos and I was like, Oh god, Marie and she's like, Come on, dance and she's like a professional dancer right, too, by the way. Right. Uh, <laughs> alongside her um but she just made stuff really fun she was yeah. just like wouldn't it be hilarious if we yeah. made a jay-z video and like people loved it because it, it was hilarious and she wasn't afraid to just do what she thought would be right. super fun because yeah. she knew other people would latch on to that so you know creating fame if, if anyone goes to creating fame you have this really good if you scroll down the page you have this really good process actually and part of it's kind of what you're talking about is the do you keep your eyes on your own paper mm -hmm. and that's sort of like you know, I like that part is just do what be you sort of. And then threes make it inevitable and four pick yourself. So I encourage anyone, you know, I know there's a, a link on there that leads back to meet Edgar, but there's some really good information mm -hmm. on that creating fame page. Yeah, well, that's good because, yeah, the course doesn't exist anymore. So hopefully right. it doesn't exist. Value just from the it, website. Was that tough to shut down? Because it was yeah. very successful also. Yeah, that, that was one of the toughest because that was kind of like my, my great work. domain name too. Well, I might, you know, I might make it into a book at some point because yeah. I, I love those ideas and I think they're really valuable. It's a good book, yeah. Um, so maybe it'll it'll live on that way. But yeah, I think a lot of that stuff that's in creating fame that I learned in B school, I really applied to Edgar with like you know the irreverent branding and having like a software be a little character. We just do a lot of things that other people in software mm -hmm. don't do, and because just for fun, you know. Yeah. I'm just curious because. That was also very successful. What made you shut it down instead of keep it up and maybe have someone else manage it or keep it going? Just focus, like relentless yeah. focus. I mean, that's also why I quit B school because B school, we started as a side project. It became hugely successful. And so it, it can no longer be a side project. And yeah. so I was like, I just. You need like, to make a choice. Yeah, I, like Marie's whole thing is like multi-passionate entrepreneur. That's not me. I like to do like one thing at a time, right. you know, give it 100%. So I just didn't want, I was like, if I'm doing software, I want to go all in on software. And and honestly, yeah. too, it was a question of numbers because, you know, we said the numbers for Edgar in the beginning. Like, so Edgar is like a $2.8 million business, you know, creating fan. 
the biggest single launch we ever did was probably like, I don't know, 500, 600,000, yeah. which is a ton, but Pretty still damn good. Much, yeah. much smaller than Edgar, honestly. Yeah. You know, so I you don't know that at the time, though. That's that's looking back, right? You had well, to make a decision and have have some guts to just drop something that was do, that had done seven figures to start this new thing, right? Yeah, I mean, like with B School, a hundred. Like when I look back at B School, I'm like, whoa, that was a bold move because that I quit entirely without knowing. You know, I didn't. I didn't start Edgar until like three years later. Creating fame, I kind of like, I held on to that longer. We did the last one in 2014, yeah. 15. So I was still like, oh, I still want to do it a little bit. So that one was more of a gradual transition. So you were still doing it and then you kind of, as like how far into Meet Edgar did you decide, okay, I just need to focus completely on this and creating fame has got to kind of got to go for the time being it was see when we launched edgar we just we viewed it as an experiment we're like you know what because i i hoped that maybe i could just do software because that sounded like a fun model but i kind of thought like maybe we'll have a software and training company and they can complement each other and then basically edgar just took off and i was like whoa like this business alone is is plenty um so we, we started phasing, it, it, it has been gradual. We've been kind of phasing out the programs kind of one by one, you know, yeah. did one last launch for creating fame and shut them down. And a lot of it kind of remnants still exist on the web and that's fine because it draws traffic and, you know, we send it sure. back in various ways. Yeah. So I want to talk about the experiment, but I first want to talk about, because really Edgar came from the process, mm-hmm. right? They were using and teaching creating fame, right? And that spreadsheet. So can yeah, you talk about a, that? A, yeah, from a program called Social Brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I had developed um, a social media kind of strategy and workflow where we had this big spreadsheet and we had different columns for every category of update, like your own blog posts, other people's blog posts, inspirational quotes. We would load up the spreadsheet with updates and then we would cycle through the updates in the columns. Yeah. With all this complicated like color coding. So I love it, those spreadsheets. Yeah. <laughs> like if there was an image, it was just a disaster because there's no good way to do images in a spreadsheet. And then we would have to, you know, copy and paste every cell into a social media scheduling program. And so I just thought, like, why why is there so much manual labor involved? Right. I mean, the one thing more than anything that stood out to me that was crazy is like why am I keeping my social media updates in a spreadsheet when I pay for a social media tool? It was like, I just thought like, it's like if WordPress is like, well, we'll send out the blog posts, but you can never see them again. We will not keep any kind of right. record of them. When you, you say know? it, it seems obvious. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's kind of what I thought. I'm like, why don't tools do that? You know, why isn't there a library? And also why can't you easily repeat content? Like I've already spent the time to load this content into the tool. Why can't I send it out again? Um, and so basically I was teaching that and then I met my husband Chris, who's a Ruby on Rails developer, yeah. and I was kind of talking to him about yeah. it and he's like, I could I could make yeah. So this was on a date, right? You were on a date with him. <laughs> so what what number of date before you start talking about well, development? That's a whole nother story. Maybe maybe the quirky thing about me. So I met I met my husband in February and we got married that same November. So yeah like dating was like we met and then we were like together 24 7 after the day that we met so i don't have like a normal when you know you know that's that's fine (laughs) i don't have like a normal timeline of of when we started talking about this but i mean yeah we got married in 2012 we launched it in 2014 so i bet it was like 20 you know i meant the date where you said where you said i can code this up well that was like we would have already been married then oh you were okay yeah yeah gotcha okay yeah he didn't start it until until later. I just, it never occurred. So honestly, I just thought it was impossible. Like it didn't occur to me to ask him, like, can you solve these frustrations? Because I just, it, it was such an obvious idea that yeah. being someone who doesn't build software, I thought, well, if they were able to do it, they would have done it, it already. Just, yeah. And it took talking to him for him to be like, now I know like anything you can do, software can do, you know, but I didn't know that at the time. So did you bring up the idea just that you were having this problem and he said, let's code it. Or did you say, can you code it? No, I think I was just kind of, I think I was just kind of talking to him about like this process is Mm. so cumbersome and like complaining probably like, why don't the tools do it? And he's like, well, I'll just build a tool that does it. And then you're like, let's go for it. Yeah. (laughs) And so when does the experiment come in? So he then goes to code it up. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, it kind of went from like, you know, kind of talking about it casually, like kind of throwing around the idea, are we really going to do this? And then I remember January 2014, we met in person in LA with, with Sarah, the, the woman who runs operations for the company. And we kind of presented it to her and we're like, what do you think? Like, should we really go this direction with a company? And yeah. she was like, so excited about it. She was all for it. So I think after we had her buy-in, we we're like, okay, we're actually doing this, like start coding, you know, put a timeline on it. Like that's when we started taking it seriously. So it took about six months from like when he started really working on it to launch. Yeah. And so then when it was ready, how'd you get it out there? I mean, so this is where the like 10 year overnight success comes in, right? right? Because I think a lot of people look at how fast we've grown and it's like, you have to remember when we launched, we launched to a list of 75,000 people interested in social media marketing. Like it's quite the cheat. <laughs> so know? was that your list that you had formed mm-hmm. over the, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 So that was the list from LKR. So I've been building that Congratulations. list. Congratulations. That's awesome. Five, five years, you know, that's, that's uh, still remarkable. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's not like we just, like, you know, found one person and then gradually went more. You know, I already had the list. I already had the Twitter following. Like, we had already built an audience. So, obviously, that made our growth a lot easier. And I was already kind of, you know, a thought leader in the social media marketing space. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know people with big lists and they may not be able to pull that off. So, you had to do some orchestration with how you launched it. So. yeah, we actually didn't do it. We did like one like kind of launch party webinar. We actually didn't do a massive launch, like a big launch because instead we did kind of different segmented offers. Like we would send one offer to yeah. people who bought something, one offer to people who bought something right. else, one offer to people who never bought. Um, a lot of people we gave coupon codes for two months free in the beginning to try it out. So we got a lot of people in that way, things like that. So what worked the best early on? Um, two months free. I two mean, months free. Everyone likes that. <laughs> And then beyond the list, you know, obviously, like now, mm. what do you do to, to get the word out besides go on podcasts like mm. this one? I mean, we do content marketing and social media marketing. Um, we do some paid ads with Facebook as well. Okay. We've kind of experimented with different things there. But we honestly don't do anything that innovative. Like we write a really high quality blog. We share it on social media. I mean, You we, practice what you preach, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. We use Edgar, you know? Yeah. That, you know, it's pretty amazing. So what, what have been the tough parts about it? You know, cause obviously you spent a long time building this list, building the mm-hmm. following, and then you release this product. It's exactly what a lot of people want. What are some of the tough parts about running the business? I mean, I, I've, you know, I've never run a software business before, so there's, there's a lot to learn there. Um, like, it, it's complicated to build and sometimes things just go wrong. Like, you know, bugs happen and mistakes happen or sometimes you fix, spend six months working on a problem and you think you have it solved and then you test it out and you're just like, we solved it wrong. Like there was just no way like to know. What? Yeah, what was what was? The it's example? mostly like boring back end stuff. Like we've done a lot of work to make our uh, like parts of the software load faster, do all the back end processing. And that process took like, just months and months longer than we thought it would. Other features were held up by that being developed. And so you can't really communicate any of this stuff to your customers because like they don't care. It doesn't matter. It means nothing to them. But they're saying, why isn't this feature live? And you're like, we're trying so hard. And I think, you know, coming from information products, it was more of a black and white, like yes, no failure. It's like, did someone, you know, write these emails? If they didn't write the emails, they didn't do their job. Where with development it's like someone did a really awesome job working on this code but not not like but it it, but it still didn't work out and now they have to kind of start from scratch you know that stuff just happens like timelines get expanded so being used to that i think more frequent failure and knowing that that's just like part of it it's just part of the process so laura in the initial version of meet edgar what was in that and what what did you consciously decide not to include in the initial it, version. It was actually pretty similar because we kept the software pretty lean. To what the it is big, today. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The biggest thing we didn't include that, that Chris and I argued about so much. Yeah, I want to hear about um, this, yeah. Was analytics. Mm. So because the whole thing is like repeating your content, I was like, people need to have really great analytics so they can see which content is working, which isn't. They know what to do mm. more on the less of. Um, and Chris was like, you know, it's just not, it's not like an essential feature, like yeah. the library and repeating the content, those are the essential features. So I thought, no, we can't launch without it. He thought, you know, we have to launch without it. And I think, you know, 
other like I think Sarah tied sided with him, so I was finally like, okay, this is great. <laughs> um, and so we just launched with with Bitly integration, which gives you a ton of analytics. Um, and so now we do have our own in-house analytics. It's okay. one of the least used features. Most of He's our customers. not going to say I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> Most of our customers never click on it. Um, and it's interesting to me today because people still will tell you that they're extremely interested. That's like when I talk to people about yeah. Ember, they often ask about the analytics. People think they want it. People think they're going to use it. But like people are too busy <laughs> to check it out, most people. So I thought that was essential. It, it was not essential. That is really interesting. So how do you log those? Because you probably get tons of feedback. Right. How do you keep track of that? And then how do you decide whether to put that in queue? Yeah, I mean, that's been another interesting part of running a software company is like how much do you decide the direction versus your own vision and how much do you decide versus what customers want? Right. And it, it can be a conflict between like our development team and our customer service team because our customer service team is like, Hearing we have to listen to people complain about this all day. People want this, but there are some things people have asked for that are, that are just hard no's for us. Um, you know, like Instagram, a lot of people want Instagram for obvious reasons, but you can't actually schedule Instagram. The tools that have Instagram, it actually pops up a reminder on your phone that says log into Instagram and press a button so it'll go live right now. Mm. Um, it's just, which is fundamentally different than our core value at Edgar, which is putting in your content and not touching it. Right. You know, so at this point, it just doesn't make sense to add Instagram. Right. But You're guided like, by that core value. Right, right. But people want it and people, compl- and people tell us they don't choose us because other tools have Instagram and we don't. So it's a it's a difficult thing you yeah know? yeah so that's one thing you cited this is our core value we're not right. going with it what's something that is either in the pipeline or a new feature that you launch that you could launch yeah i mean um we we've used a lot of customer feedback on the way our schedule is displayed we now have a much more like it looks a lot more like google calendar kind mm. of visual showing what you have every day that was a hundred percent based on customer feedback yeah. um we've improved our rss feeds quite a bit because that's one of the easiest ways to get content into edgar um we're splitting up in the future like right now when you add content it's like one text box and you click do i want like twitter facebook linkedin yeah and people have asked us to separate that out so they can craft distinct Different updates mm-hmm. I gotcha. each network which that was kind of one of those like we didn't really know which way people wanted it um, more and more people want to modify for the different social networks. So that's something based on feedback that we're working on. What are some of the other most popular features in Meet Edgar? Um, just the fact that we have categories. People, and they love that they're color coded. That's one of the things we get so the most. So, what about categories? Yeah. On. Well, oh. so um, people, like, a lot of people don't even think about the fact that they have categories for their social yeah. media updates until they log into Edgar because we give you defaults. And a lot of people, I think it's just this huge light bulb moment, like, because it makes social media not feel like this random mess anymore. Because social media to so many people is like panic posting anything I can think of (laughs) because I haven't posted in a few days. So introducing this this framework of categories, it just allows you to wrap your head around it. Like, oh, I post these five different types of updates. I can just go in my library and fill in those types. It's very easy to batch when you're doing one update at a time. I'm going to go through my blog and put my old posts in. I'm going to go through an inspirational quotes library and find 30 of them that I like and paste them in. It just allows you to wrap your mind around the whole thing and kind of like organize your whole content library on social. Yeah, I love that. It goes back to your spreadsheet, right? Mm-hmm. Your color-coded mm-hmm. spreadsheet. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I know you consciously, you know, deliberately decide on the site, if you go to meetedgar.com, you know, there's a get your invitation. So tell me about what made you decide to create that language and that button as opposed to, you know, most websites you go and you go to the pricing page or whatever it is. Right, right. Yeah, you know what really inspired me about that. So a lot of um, a, a lot of companies have like a pre-launch landing page, which we did as well. So before their launch, they just have a simple landing page, and it'll say something like "Get your invitation." Right. And I just noticed, like from my own behavior, that I am a sucker for those. I will sign up for absolutely anything because I'm like, I want to know what it is. They're going to give me a good deal when they launch. Like maybe I'll get a month free. Like, right. I'll right. Check it out. And. I noticed in that thinking, I'm like, why is that? And I think it's because asking for an invitation is a very easy yes. It's yeah. a very easy way to say, you know what? I'm sort of interested in this. I may or may not buy it, but like, give me some more info yeah. when you can. Where yeah. so it's much less of a commitment. 
Exactly. Yeah. So, so much software, the call to action is a free trial. And I think people just think like, oh, it's free. Who wouldn't want that? But a free trial is a huge time commitment. Like you have to go in, you have to learn the software, you know, something like Edgar, there's setup time involved. Yeah. So you feel like you have to kind of hustle before that free trial to see if you right. like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like make a decision. So um, I think actually from like a prospect point of view, asking someone to do a free trial is actually like not really their best like their best way to connect with you it's kind of asking a lot of them where saying get an invitation it's a way for them to say okay i might like sure i might be interested send me some emails send me some more info yeah. and then obviously we get to capture the email of everyone who's who's sort of interested who maybe yeah. doesn't have time to sign up doesn't have time to do a trial yeah. when they're visiting our site yeah listen to someone who's helped collect over eighty thousand emails <laughs> on what she knows what she's doing um how do you decide on pricing because it was also interesting is you don't have a tiered model. It's like a okay. one, one price. Yeah, yeah. Um, pricing. I mean, we've done some experimenting with. We wanted to be, we wanted to be in the same league as like small business priced similar software. So yeah. we very deliberately did not have a ten dollar plan. Yeah. You know, like other tools have have cheaper like five or ten dollar mm-hmm. plans, and we really wanted to say you know what, we're business software. Because the weird thing about social media is sometimes you have social media tools that you just use for fun. Like maybe you're a blogger, maybe you're just active on social. Um, We really wanted to say we're not a tool just to use for fun, we're a tool to use for social media marketing. So the price is part of the way for us to say it's 50 bucks, it's it's for businesses. Right, and you could read comments out there and people are like, I I would get it if it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, oh man, what do we do here? What about a more expensive plan? Do you, do you experiment or you think about that that would provide yeah, something and, else? And we actually do have a $99 plan that some people upgrade to. Yeah, although okay. most 49 covers the needs of like 90% of people. Um, and we have done more extensive plans in the past. The thing is we don't have a sales team. We, we only have marketing. We're 100% inbound. So usually those bigger contracts, they want kind of a sales process. I gotcha. um, that's just, that's not our focus. We're a hundred percent small business. Yeah. yeah. So what does the $99 include? That one, more social accounts. Um, and a big oh, product. okay. It does. Okay. So I can see people using that. Yeah. It's just, it's been a bit of a challenge for us because Edgar actually like, you know, this is interesting when you're doing software, you just, from the outside, you kind of think like, oh, just like, yeah, I'll let people add on more social accounts and charge them more. But that's not what I think because because (laughs) I can imagine, you know, actually coding up to integrate with that is a pain in the butt. Well, that's the thing. So the tool, you have to design your tool for a certain use case. So Edgar was really designed for like 10 accounts or less. When you have 25 accounts on Edgar, it starts to get a little messy. Like, you know, there's too many accounts listed. It's not as fluid. So I would, I would honestly rather do it in a way where people are doing like one brand per account if they're managing multiple they have different instances we just haven't honestly just haven't figured out the like kind of simplest way to do that so with the the um 49 plan you get the linkedin the facebook and twitter with one account right no you get 10 you get oh, you 10 get accounts, ten, oh 10 accounts however you want so yeah. people need more than 10 accounts usually the 99 well, usually they're plan. managing usually they're managing more than one brand oh i got you i got yeah. you okay Got it. That makes sense. Um, and so what are some common questions you get when people compare you? Because I'm sure you have people comparing you to Buffer, Hootsuite. I figured I have you in front of me. How do you respond to the people who say, well, is this like one of the other tools I use or, or I'm looking at? Right. I mean, we have a very easy answer because we actually do have a fundamentally different feature set, which is you build a library of content and then it repeats over and over again. So. Uh-huh. I mean, one of the easiest ways to explain it is it's like Buffer if Buffer never ran out. You know, like the problem with Buffer is that you have to keep reloading it over and over again. And I feel like when Buffer launched, they were very innovative in their category because before you had to schedule everything manually. So Buffer's like, okay, we've made this innovation, right? You don't have to choose a time slot. You just put it all in the list and we'll choose the time slot. And I think we, you know, my point of view is we've innovated beyond that to like, okay, not only do you not have to choose a time slot, just put all your content in once and then we'll just send it out for you we'll just yeah. handle it every day yeah yeah and that is, that is an innovation and i don't know if there's anything you could share now because i know you're always thinking and innovating what is going to be you think the next innovation or what you're working on now that you're going to release soon i mean it just depends on how people use social media and how it goes i mean we're definitely not planning any like major changes in the functionality of the tool right now 
Um, yeah, well, you know, we're going to follow what, what small businesses do with social. Yeah. How tough is it to, to code up another, like, if some, you decide to include Snapchat or Instagram or something, does that take a long time to do? It, it, yes. And, and part of it is not just like, okay, adding another tool. It's a bigger question of, we are, are very intent on making our tool as simple as possible and providing a strong case for one for one use case like we're not you can't do customer service on our tool you can't do facebook ads on our tool we're not trying to be a in all be all social media tool so it's not just the like time it would take to add another platform it's like how much does that complicate every single part of the tool yeah and laura what's interesting also is your co-founder is your husband Mm -hmm. and so how do you what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of having, you know, because people do have family members who they right. start companies with or who work with. How do you navigate that? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's actually pretty easy to work together um, because the... Because you're I mean, in charge. Because so, no, I'm in charge. <laughs> well, no, but that's true. So we actually don't, like, you know, when you say co-founder, that's accurate enough because yeah. he would be called a co-founder most places. But we actually don't call him co-founder because he's not interested in running the business. Like CTO. he likes the right. He gotcha. likes the technical side. He likes the product. But it's it's I'm I'm the founder at the end of the day. So right. like he gets to be in charge of the technical side. I get to be in charge of the business side. And, right. and my expertise is marketing. His is not. His is product. Mine is not. So we have a very clear you know division of duties. You delineate the responsibility. So if it's like okay, if it's under the business side, I take care of that. If mm-hmm. it's under the technical side, then that's his you know his ocean that yeah. he works with. Um, so Laura, since it's in Sparty Insider, I always ask one of the lowest points. Mm. And then how you push through it. I mean, you know, we've talked about B-School. I mean, deciding to leave B-School was an incredibly difficult really? decision because it was very much a gut decision. It was like, especially looking back now, there was like nothing rational about that decision because it was doing really well. Um, and I really liked working with Marie. Like it was fun. Like at the time I lived in LA and she lived in New York and we were always like flying back and forth and like, it, it was just it was just fun. We had built this great yeah. community of people who loved the product. Yeah. But I just had this gut feeling like this is not my mm. passion. You know, like this is Marie's passion. Like this yeah. is a fun to work on, but I kind of saw like this is going to keep taking off and I cannot do this casually. Really? Like I got to be all in on this. And yeah. I just didn't feel in my gut um, like I really was. And I'm like, I was terrified to tell her. I was like, mm. it took me a long time to work up the nerve to tell her. Because Why? Because of course I, you know, she was going to be disappointed because we had built this together and I was bailing on her. You felt like you were letting her down. Right. I was saying, I don't want to do this anymore. We had never really like, we just assumed we were going to keep working on it together, Yeah. you know? So I really didn't want to disappoint her or make, I was afraid, you know, she would feel like she couldn't do it without me, which is laughable now because she did much better (laughs) without me. We'll never know. (laughs) Um, but but yeah, that was a really hard thing just to feel like I was letting down a yeah. good a good friend. Yeah. So know? how'd that conversation go? It went pretty well because she because we were good friends, I mean she didn't want me to do anything that I wasn't all in. And and I mean we have the same philosophy about business that way. Like I never want I never want anyone to work for me that's not super excited to be there every day. Yeah. Like I don't like when companies have like stock options that vest because I'm like, I don't want someone waiting around for five right. years to get the payout. Like I want them to be in today. If they don't right. like it anymore, they should leave. So, yeah. you know, she feels the same. Like she didn't want to work with someone who didn't, who wasn't a hundred percent excited about it. Yeah. So how do you navigate that parting ways? Cause I, this happens all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Two people start it. One, one person keeps going with it as a vision. The other person doesn't. And there's also like, well, we started this together. Do we, do I get a portion going forward or do I not? How do you navigate that or recommend people? Well, I recommend you do that before you start, which right. we did not. We did not have. That's probably pretty have, common. Yeah. Right, right. We like we had an agreement that it was 50-50, but we did not have any sort of agreement as to what would happen if one of us so wanted leave. to leave. Right. Um, so, yeah, she ended up buying me out, um, but it was very much a challenge to figure out. We just had to figure out, you know, pretty randomly what felt fair to both of us. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was tough. And it's t- even tougher sometimes when it's successful. You know, mm-hmm. if it's, if it's, oh, it's not making much money, it doesn't matter, you could have it, and then, but when it's doing well, you have to figure that out. Right. 
market, right? And it, and also, yeah, it was doing well and it was new. So it's like, well, how much is it worth so far? How much will it be worth, you know? Yeah, also, like, she had to redo, because the whole branding was us together, you know, she used the same content, but she did have to redo all the marketing and all the content for the course. So it's like, she's obviously still going to have she a lot of She just put work. a big X over your face and all <laughs> right. the, the marketing. No. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it wasn't just as simple as, okay, we invented this product together and now you can just keep churning it out at the factory, right, you know? Right. So, so yeah, all those things considered, we were able to come to an agreement okay. that, that we were both happy with. Yeah. No, I'm sure. Yeah. That's really common. So I wanted to ask you on that. So what about the proudest moment on the flip side? The proudest moments for me, like, so my, my team is all remote. So everyone works mm. from their own home. Nice. Um, and we meet up together twice a year. So we just had the most recent one um, here in Austin in February. And so, of course, everyone that we have is the biggest one we've ever had. Yeah, what do you <laughs> do? You do? We're growing the business. Um, we, like, we take a week. We usually kind of like work in the morning and hang out in the afternoon and do fun stuff. Um, so, yeah, so this one, this one maybe like 12 or 13 people came. Um, and that's the part that makes me feel incredibly proud and incredibly mm-hmm. fulfilled more than like when we're together and I'm looking around and I'm like, these people have a job that they love because of something that I helped to create yeah. that like, that's what I'm in this for. That's rewarding. That feels yeah. Incredible. yeah. So what are some other things Laura that you do to keep that culture, even though they're remote? Mm-hmm. Um, some other things that we do, I mean, we are, you know, goofing off on Slack all the time, like most remote companies. We do a lot of video chats. Like every morning, we do a company wide oh, really? video chat. That's cool. Um, just to see, like, it just helps you connect. To, like, I am working with other humans. You're like, you I know? am working. No, I'm just- <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And we always go to video chat when there's something like a little more in depth that we need to discuss, you know. Video chat's very, very important. And we do just like fun things, like, we did a secret Santa last year that was super fun. Mm-hmm. Um, we we always are trying out different things because there's not a lot established for a remote company. So like we have watched movies. There's like this tool where you can all watch a movie oh, really? together from your own computers. <laughs> so like we do that and we like chat about the movie um, or just like send That's people funny. things in the mail and then we all have like a thing if I have any. Like we all have our little Edgar coffee cups and you see people with them and it kind of feels like you're all working in the same place. It's just like little things <laughs> The like video that. makes a big difference. Yeah. 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 What other tools do you use? So you use Slack for the remote teams. You use Slack. Mm-hmm. use the video chat. What else? Um, our development team uses Trello yeah. and the rest of our team uses Asana for task management. Mm-hmm. Um, we use Help Scout for our customer service. Mm-hmm. We use Stripe for payment processing. Yeah. Um, mentors. I know you're always learning. You're always re- listening to business books and, mm-hmm. and talk to a lot of people. You're creating fame. Mm-hmm. You've helped a lot of people. Who are some of your mentors? And I know you mentioned Marie and mm-hmm. besides her and, and some of their best advice. I mean, my mentors are my friends like i love hanging out with entrepreneurs um here in austin noah kagan is a good friend of mine so you know he's a really smart marketer he's also a really great connector um he regularly like invites me to lunches with other interesting people here in austin um i just i mean i have so many it's like austin's like a hotbed of entrepreneurs yeah yeah it is who else yeah who else is interesting that people should check out company wise or or person wise um, another like friend and mentor is um, Ian Schoen. He hosts the Tropical MBA mm-hmm. um, and their company. They had an e-commerce company they sold. Now they have a uh, like forum called Dynamite Circle. Um, another really smart entrepreneur. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just there's tons of people. Like, I just love talking to my friends about what they're what they're up to right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Thank you so much, Laura. This has been awesome. And I love hearing the behind the scenes on Meet Egder. Um, I have one last question, but before I ask it, just tell people where should they go. I know they should go to meetegger.com. They should go to meetegger.com backslash Edgar dash on dash air. And we'll link that up in the notes. Also, where else should they, they check out social media or what you have, what you're up to? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at LKR. So that's another good LKR. Place to go. Okay, great. So what have we not covered that about Meet Edgar that we should talk about? Um, I mean, we haven't 
kind of touched on the time saving, which is which is one of the hugest benefits that people have. Actually, one of the funniest emails that we get is, uh, I feel really guilty guilty telling you this, but I fired someone from my company. Nice work. <laughs> <laughs> after I brought on Edgar. Um, and also the fact that it's, you know, we always call Edgar he and we use a person's name. A lot of the reviews people will write, like, I brought a new guy into my company. His name's Edgar. That's He's funny. taking care of social media for me. But I love reading that because that was really the intent that yeah. all the things you've been doing manually, you can now just have software do for you yeah. um so i mean the time saving is is really Huge. massive because yeah. it really is you load it up and of course you keep tweaking and you keep adding things but i mean our time on social media i've just seen in our own company it has just dropped dramatically and actually uh tom is the guy who runs social at our company and he was telling me he's like he's like i kind of feel like I don't spend enough time like coming up with social content. I'm like, that's because you already came right. like our, Edgar is so full. You already came up with so much. She's like, but shouldn't I be adding new stuff every right. week? I'm like, not if you don't need to. I'm like, our, our results still great. He's like, yeah. I'm like, Edgar is too easy. He's like, I want to keep my job. <laughs> <laughs> that should be the tagline. Only $50. You can fire an employee. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> What's your favorite success story from Edgar that you've gotten? Oh man. I mean, like we have, we need to have more on our blog because we've actually done a few customer interviews and we haven't actually published mm -hmm. them yet. I mean, there's yeah. one on our blog that you can read um, from Wine Wine Tracker, which is actually like a wine app where you track the wine that you like. And mm -hmm. they've used Edgar largely for Twitter. Um, they got to like 20,000 followers in six months, wow. all organic. Um, and they're an interesting case study because one of the biggest objections that we hear is like, can I really repeat content and how much can I repeat content? Right, right. Um, and it's fascinating looking at their stats. I mean, really it's the same for all of our all of our customers. What's always interesting to me is you look at the same status update and they will post things like two and a half, three weeks later, which a lot of people would consider pretty frequent. Yeah. You look at their status updates, it's actually sometimes uncanny. It'll get the exact same amount of retweets three that weeks later amazing. without fail. That's it's amazing. like 12 times, 13 times, 12 times. You just see every time they post it, it gets the same engagement, yeah. Yeah. which people think that it'll drop off, but it's largely a new audience every time. So it kind of right. makes sense. It's going to get the same results. Right. right. Yeah. And people don't think, they think, oh, I'm just going to piss people off. And I had right. someone do a social experiment where they put their, their birthday like every, not even two weeks, but like every day, they go, oh, it's my birthday. And they did it every day to see when people actually notice that they just <laughs> reposted it every day. And I think, it, I forgot what they said. It took like 10 days for people to actually get pissed off. Like, stop saying it's your birthday. That's but really it took funny. that long. So, yeah. People, yeah. yes, Meet Edgar, huge time <laughs> saver. Go to meetedgar.com. Laura, this is awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. What I got. Can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand